Hello, my name is Daniel Culligan. Welcome to this third lecture on classical Armenian syntax. Here's a roadmap of what we will see in this section. We will take a look at nonverbal predication, the various copular verbs that Armenian has, the types of negation, the use of pronouns, and the basic functions of its verbal categories. So first, let's have a look at copular verbs. There is a defective verb, go, the only verb with a present stem suffix o in Armenian that forms various present uh, tense forms like go, the third singular, gom, the third plural, and there's an imperfect guil, guyin, and an infinitive gol, and a subjunctive gutse, uh, which goes back to gu itse with the subjunctive morpheme its uh, that has been lexicalized to perhaps it could be. In the uh, indicative and infinitive, it is used as a verbum substantivum, so it uh, predicates existence. There is, there are. So here's an example from Yeznik. Uh, go hanar torutian uh, So there exists, there is a means of forgiveness, namely by repentance. Go is uh, combinable with locative predication. Uh, here's an example from Luke. Dev go inama, there is a devil inside him. Uh, and it is combinable with the genitive for possessive predication. So in Matthew 8.20, Arvesuts vorze gone. So the foxes have holes to hide in. So literally, um, there are, there exist holes of foxes. The other verb, M, uh, that is the first singular present is M, uh, is used for predications of properties, so with adjectives and nouns, for possession, location, and existence. Its aorist is applied by the verb linim to become. So let's have a look at how this works. We have property, for example, Yesem Gabriel, so I am Gabriel, uh, quite simply. Uh, we have possession with the genitive, uh, as in the following example, Banan Voch E Im, so this is uh, the possessive, the second, uh, first person singular of the personal pronoun. Um, so, and here is our copula verb. And uh, here we have hor, that is the genitive of the word for father. So this word is not mine, but my father's. Um, it uh, can also occur that the uh, possessor is marked for dative in Armenian. Uh, we find this, for example, in the Bible translation. We have Vorum Anun Er Nazaret, so a city whose name was Nazareth. Um, and here we have the dative of the relative pronoun Vorum. And note that this is, of course, similar to what we have in the Greek. So once more, the question arises if this is a calc of Greek syntax. But things are not that easy because there are mismatches both ways. So I'll just give an example here for uh, an Armenian dative corresponding to a Greek genitive. This is Mark 14. Uh, so a place called Gethsemane. Uh, and in the Greek, so here we have the Armenian dative and in the Greek, we have a genitive. So, um, and there are also examples for mismatches the other way around. In his fabulous book uh, on the uh, Armenian Bible, his edition and uh, dictionary, Künstler in 1984, points out the difference uh, to different translations of the Greek tenos estai will be and tenos ginetai becomes, with the genitive and the dative respectively in parallel passages. Uh, have a look at these examples here. So uh, in Luke, we have um inotsane linitsi kim, uh, kin, so tinas auton ginetai gune, so in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be, so who had been married to seven subsequent uh, husbands. And uh, in Matthew, we have uir yutians njiritsi na kin, with the genitive. Um, so this seems to correspond to tinos ginetai and tinos estai in the Greek version. Um, probably, of course, the dative can be understood as marking the recipient, to whom will she be given, and the genitive as marking the possessor, whose will she be. Uh, and for this we can compare, of course, dative marking the experiencer with the copula verb in other passages. So, for example, usti e ins ice. So, why is this granted to me, or why does this happen to me? Uh, translating simply the Greek potenmoi tutor. 
For location, uh, with this copula verb, there are many examples, of course, like in Mark 2.2, itane, he's in the house, or uh, existence, which can also be uh, expressed with this verb, isgizbani, er, banan, so at the beginning of the Gospel of John, um, in or from the beginning was the word. So here with an interesting ablative in the Armenian version. Perhaps since M is so frequent, it is interesting to note where it is omitted. And this is the case on the one hand in relative clauses, uh, frequently, not always, but it does occur. Here's an example from um, Acts of the Apostles. Yeken kahanaya peten yev vor und nama. So relative, vor, und, with, and nama, uh, the dative uh, locative of the uh, third person pronoun, so those who were with him, but were is not present in the sentence itself. And also in uh, negated clauses, we frequently find lack of the copula. Um, so in Jesnik, so the first Armenian theologian, we have Chev Urik Vordi Imiji, not yet is there in brackets anywhere a son present. So this is simply a nominal clause, as it were. Um, so these are two positions where this uh, very frequent verb is actually missing in Armenian in many instances. The third verb, uh, which is relevant here, is come, which uh, as a lexical verb means stand originally. So we can see this still in the Bible translation, vor uh, znovav kayin, so those who were standing around him. So this translates the Greek uh, ton pares dekoton. But it tends to be desemanticized uh, and then indicates location more generally. For example, it can also translate a verb like sit, uh, the Greek katisas. In uh, the second example on this slide, kaya Jesus endedem ganzanakin. So Jesus was sitting opposite the treasury. Uh, so kaya for um, the uh, Greek katisas. And uh, so there are other instances uh, where it can even translate lie. Uh, so ur kair marminen Jesusi, so where Jesus' body was lying. So in the Greek we have ekato, and in Armenian we have kaya, so the verb that originally means stand. And then finally, it can also be used as a copula, uh, denoting existence, uh, possession, location. Uh, and as a copula in the stricter sense. So we have ka uh, yevis teri, there is still room, eti topos estin, um, in that meaning uh, that there is something present. Possession, uh, this is uh, quite a nice example where we have both the verb uh, m, which we've just seen, and the verb come to stand uh, next to each other. So uiritsin, so this is the uh, subjunctive of m, b, uh, and here we have our other verb, um, stand, literally, um, and both are used to translate, as we can see, the Greek uh, echon, the participle of to have. So he who has two tunics and who has some food should give it to those who have nothing. Um, so two different verbs translating the same Greek uh, element uh, with uh, similar meanings here in the Armenian. Um, it is also used, of course, for location. Uh, so, vor i gerismans kaitsen, so those who were in the graves, hoi entois menemeios in the Greek, uh, and simply as a copula verb. So, this is the last example here, go vor cherachos ka as jens mofses. There's one who is your prosecutor, Moses. So, um, we have uh, all the functions uh, that we see in the other verbs also in come. Again, uh, it is interesting to see uh, perhaps uh, where we don't have copula verbs, where we might expect them from other languages. Um, so uh, this is the case in uh, the negation of existence, uh, which can be expressed by a simple nominal clause uh, with the proclitic negative particle ch and the indefinite pronoun ik, anything. So this is uh, the example here in Luke uh, 8.17, chik inch tzatzuk vorvoch yait litsi. So there is nothing hidden that will not be made manifest. So here we have our form chick, there is nothing, uh, and uh, we will see this word again uh, when we talk about uh, nominal derivation, uh, because that is also the basis for some derivatives. 
Um, interestingly, if you compare the parallel text in Mark 4, 22, uh, there uh, the translator uses the copula verb, uh, which is, of course is always a possibility. Um, so chir, that is the negative particle, and a, um, the present of the verb, to be uh, in a similar sentence. Nothing is hidden except to be made manifest. Um, and we've just seen uh, that there are uh, basically uh, two uh, particles for factual negation, that is voch and uh, the proclitic ch. So uh, chikamim, I do not want, or vojgitek, zoron, you do not know the day. So these are the two basic forms of factual negation. Um, for prohibitions, um, there is me used together with the subjunctive or the imperative uh, present, the prohibitive that you've already heard about in the section on verbal morphology. In the latter case, so with the imperative forms, only the present imperative is used. Uh, positive imperatives always occur in the aorist. So here are two examples. Me, Yerkenchir, do not fear. So this is Yerkenchim, to be afraid, um, and uh, the imperative form of that. Um, and uh, importantly, the subjunctive is also used as a future tense. So uh, there are instances where we can differentiate uh, between the uh, text, the, the temporal and uh, the modal use of the subjunctive by looking at the negation. So voc and me, of course, then differentiate between the two. So we have in Luke 16, for example, voc havanist sin, which is most likely a factual negation. They will not be convinced. So even if someone should rise from the dead, they won't believe it. They won't be convinced, which uh, would be different if this were me, which would mean they shall not, they should not uh, believe this or should not be convinced. Armenian has negative concord, so when we talk about negation, um, it doesn't cancel negative meanings uh, if you add more negative particles. So um, if you look at the Buzandaran, uh, which uh, uses this feature quite frequently uh, for emphasis, of course, voc mi voc, voc apretuzaner, so nobody survived, so not one, anyone not survived. No, so nobody survived at all. Or vojmenats i notsane je vojmi, which is a very formulaic phrase that we find frequently in this text. Um, so not remained of them, not even one. Uh, and here's an example where we have a kind of uh, addition of negative particles uh, to some extent, uh, and the whole phrase, of course, is simply negative. So this is about uh, a missionary who is not very successful and uh, um, so he tries to evangelize people but uh, not one of them could keep in mind a single thing of what he had heard, not a word, not half a word, not a minimal record, not a trace. Um, and here we have voc, voc, so this is nobody, uh, this is reinforced with voc me, voc, not even one, uh, voc me ban, not a word, voc kispani, not half a word, uh, voc duisen hishatak inch, so uh, not a minimal record, voc nishmarans, voc karein inch unel imiti. They could not keep it unel imiti in their mind. So this simply reiterates and emphasizes uh, the negative meaning at all. Um, Armenian is a prodrop language, so marking person on the verb uh, and uh, the nominative. Uh, of personal pronouns is used for pragmatic purposes. So for example, uh, when they are in focus position, um, when they're emphasized. So uh, here are two examples, Dugek Luis Ashari, so you are the light of the world. Or uh, in contrast, uh, contrasting uh, context, Na er truck, uh, so he was a burning lamb and Duk Kamitsaruk Tsensal, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Um, so that is the usual way to use the pronouns, the nominative forms of the pronouns in Armenian. And uh, co-referential pronouns, of course, may be uh, dropped in coordinated predicates. So here's an example. Atein, halatein, asnosayev, spananein, and here asnosa is our object pronoun. And uh, that, of course, is the object of all three uh, verbs, uh, predicates that we have in this sentence. Now, let's have a look at grammatical categories of the verb. Um, we've heard this already in the section on the verbal morphology, so just as a short repetition, um, 
we have a basically a distinction between a present and an aorist stem and uh, from the former the present and the imperfect tense are derived and from the latter the aorist so the perfective past and the perfect and the pluperfect. There is no future tense formation, we've just mentioned this, so usually for future time reference either the present indicative but mostly more frequently the subjunctive is used and mostly the aorist subjunctive which in traditional Armenian grammatical terminology is simply called the future for that reason because this is its most frequent function. The aorist indicative is always a past tense, so the spectral opposition, perfective as against imperfective, is pertinent as the relation between aorist imperfect in the indicative and present aorist in the subjunctive. There is an infinitive which is a spectrally neutral, although it is derived usually from the present stem, but it does not contrast with any other infinitive formation as it does, for example, in Greek, where you have a present infinitive luyain and uh, an aorist infinitive lusai. Uh, so this is different in Armenian. So let's have a look at the basic functions of these categories. The present tense can, of course, refer to the moment of speech, uh, to general states of affairs, and, as I've just said, also to the future. So, an example or examples for the latter cases are given here on this slide. Ga zuraguin kanzis eskni im. So, there is somebody coming after me, so he will come after me, who is mightier than I am. Or from Yeznik, yorum awur utes i ruin. So, on that day that you eat from the fruit of this tree, that day you will die. And here we simply have present tense forms referring to future events. Um, the present tense uh, is rather rare in past contexts. So, what uh, in grammars is called a historical present sometimes, uh, in the Gospels, uh, they are often translated by imperfect or aorists. Uh, if they are interpreted as perfective by the translators and not as presents. So here's an example um, of uh, a Greek present, afiesin, translated as uh, an aorist in Armenian. So we have afiesin auton, or diabolos, the devil left him, and apa yetorosna satana in the Armenian version. Uh, so present translated as aorist. Um, in this case, uh, this is another example where, uh, in contrast to the one we've just seen, the uh, um, Greek presents are translated as imperfect forms. So this, of course, always depends on the interpretation that uh, the Armenian translator makes of the uh, spectral distinctions in his language and uh, in the Greek original text. So here we have erchontai ferontes, uh, twice uh, present tense forms translated as gayin arna berein, so they came and brought uh, a paralytic to him. So both options are, of course, possible. As an exception to what I've just said, uh, there are two verbs that occur with some frequency as historical presents, and these are asem and gum, so the word for say and the word for come. Um, asem, uh, in the first case, uh, when asem is used as a speech introduction, there's a strong tendency uh, to coordinate an aorist of a preceding verb with a present tense of asem, uh, while it occurs in the imperfect if the preceding verb is also an imperfect. Um, so let's look at two examples for this. Um, we have patashani it yev ase, so answer gave, so this is a typical light verb construction that is so frequent in Armenian, we'll see that later again. And then here we have the present asem say of the, the verb um, in the third person singular in this case. So this is uh, one frequent combination. Um, and the other instance uh, is with the imperfect um, in Joser and Yabor Kum Yev Aser. So he was talking to your brother and he said. And so this is a kind of 90% rule, one might say where most frequently these two combinations occur. So what we actually don't find or just very, very rarely find are cases with uh, an imperfect and then a present tense of asem. So that doesn't seem to be very frequent. The other verb, uh, the historical present of gum, mostly occurs in sentence initial position, uh, frequently introducing new reference into the discourse, so it acts as a kind of stage direction, uh, which is a bit outside the narrative itself. 
Um, and once more, uh, we've mentioned this uh, already, uh, Mofsis Khorenatsi is an author who uses the historical present more frequently generally, not just with these two verbs. Um, this may be due to his preference for Greek historiography as a stylistic model, where this use of the present is, of course, common. Okay, we have here uh, one example for this. Uh, gan, um, in word uh, sentence initial position, Gan uh, Yachbarkinyev Mainura, so his brothers and his mother came wishing to see him. Um, so here we have our present uh, form uh, of uh, this verb um, introducing new reference into the discourse. Okay, the aorist, uh, now coming to the aspectual distinction in the past, uh, the aorist usually depicts an event as located as a specific, at a specific point in the past, uh, whereas the imperfect is neutral with regard to this, so it allows the attribution of an event to one or more points in the past. The imperfective thus frequently describes a past event coinciding with another event in the aorist. So there are some examples for this here on the slide. Um, so minch der anzaner and ein Jesus, setir ein Mora, kur kirku, arakein yev asain. So and as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud. So here we have. Uh, passing along and crying and saying, um, coinciding with this and also with uh, the event of following. Um, it is of course used for uh, describing habitual events, so um, as in this example, arahaker, an imperfect of arahakem, to shout um, in a context night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out. So here we have our imperfect marking a habitual or repeated event in the past. So as you would expect it from a well-behaved imperfective aspect um, in an aspectual system. Um, and of course it may describe continued events. So this is the next uh, example here, Mark 10, 48. Um, so, uh, he began to cry out and say, uh, have mercy on me, and people rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more and said the same thing once again. So here we have the same form again, uh, describing something that goes on for some time more and is not uh, finished. In contrast to this, the aorist describes an event as located at a specific point in the past. So for example, gitem to know and uh, the aorist is gitatsi, I knew at that moment, uh, or I realized. Um, so in Luke 8.46, for example, Asi Jesus omen merzitav yis, kanzi gitatsi, yitizurutyun il yinein. So Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceived at that moment in the past that power has gone out from me. So here this uh, coincides with the Greek um, uh, aorist uh, egnon. Um, so in this instance both languages actually have the same aspect uh, form but this is not always the case. Uh, we've already seen this. Um, Armenian is of course uh, independent of uh, what Greek does with its aspectual system. In contrast to this um, we can look at this example with gitein, an imperfect. Uh, Yevnuk have watched gitein as banan but they didn't understand the saying and were afraid to ask him so this is something that of course uh, is a state of affairs that lasts for a longer time or is not uh, located at a specific moment. So because they didn't understand this for quite some time. Now finally let's have a look at the Armenian perfect. Um, the Armenian perfect denotes a state which results from a previous action or event and obtains at reference time. That is the present in the perfect and the past in the pluperfect. Uh, one may describe it in the terminology of Nedjalkov and Bybee as a resultative. Let's have some uh, examples for uh, the perfect and how it typically works. Um, so the verb to come near is uh, derived from merz near, uh, so merz anam, uh, to come close. Um, and the perfect means to have come near, that is to be near. Uh, so in the first example, merz yale arkeutyun yerknitz. Um, to approach. This is our participle, this is our uh, copula verb, and this forms the perfect tense. And uh, the overall meaning of this construction is the kingdom of heaven is close by, it has approached, it is near now. And in Luke, uh, this is the story of the prodigal son, of course. 
I svor di immerial er, so this son of mine was dead. Uh, so this is the participle of meranim, to die, and this is the imperfect of to be, so this together forms the pluperfect tense, and um, it has a, a meaning uh, of a state in the past. Um, and you know from the story, of course, uh, but he came alive again, he is alive now, so this need not imply uh, that the state still holds it at the moment of speaking in the case of the pluperfect. Um, now, Leonie, uh, in his treatment of the uh, Armenian perfect, has discussed the use of aorist and perfect forms uh, with some nice examples that I would like to show. Um, so, for example, when St. Paul talks about the death and resurrection of Christ, uh, when talking about the former, the Armenian translator uses the aorist to report an event at some point in the past without making any implication about the state of affairs at the moment of speech. So uh, we have Christos, Vasen Mer Merav, so Christ died for us uh, at some specific point in the past, closed event. Um, and uh, one may assume that the perfect would not be uh, a good choice in this instance, uh, as it would imply that the subject is still dead at the moment of speech, uh, which would be contrary, of course, to the speaker's intention in this case, who is preaching uh, after the resurrection of Christ. Um, and in contrast to this, the translator uses the perfect when he talks about the resurrected Christ to indicate that he is alive at the moment of speech. Um, note that the Greek version has an aorist here just as in the preceding uh, example. Um, so again, the Armenian use is independent, of course, from the Greek. It does not copy simply the choice of aspect stems that we find in the Greek text. So here, in this example, we have Christos harutsial e, so Christ has risen um, from the dead and the implication is, is alive now at the moment of speaking. Now, uh, a special feature of the Armenian perfect is that uh, it uses uh, genitive subjects. Um, we have already heard about this in the section on verbal morphology. Um, in the case of transitive verbs, um, of course, then this may highlight, if we have a transitive verb, either the state of the logical subject or the object or both. Um, so let's have a look at some examples for this. Um, in the first case, uh, the state of the subject seems to be implied or highlighted. Um, so here is our participle uh, for the verb to read, uh, and here we have our genitive subject, so the logical subject of the clause marked for genitive because read is a transitive verb. Um, and uh, the discussion is about um, haven't you read that is, don't you know because you have read it, what David did when he was hungry, etc., and uh, so on. So um, the important point here is that are you not well informed about this story because you have read it at some point in the past. So this is about the mental state, as it were, of um, the people Jesus is discussing with at this uh, moment. Um, of course, uh, the other way is possible too, to um, indicate the state of the object, and uh, we find this on this slide, um, Mark 16. Um, so here we have an unexpressed uh, agent, uh, and simply the object is highlighted, of course, present in the sentence. So, Zvemen is our object, the stone, and uh, this is the verb to roll away. So, somebody had rolled away the stone from the grave, and uh, the agent here doesn't uh, have anything to do with this state of affairs, uh, which focuses um, the state of the stone. Outside the Bible translation, uh, the participle frequently occurs without the copula and is used as a simple narrative verb form, usually obeying the same principles of case marking which we have already seen. An example for this um, is with the intransitive verb to appear uh, from Agatangelos, uh, so a vision from God appeared to the king's sister, and that is the complete sentence. So there is no copula or anything else anywhere. Um, so then we get a new sentence. And this is something we find quite frequently in uh, especially Armenian historians um, telling stories uh, just by using the participle. Right. Um, and uh, here uh, we have an example with an intransitive verb and a genitive subject. Um, so here we have uh, the 
uh, participle of kam, ikial, um, and here we have amenitsun, our subject in the genitive, although this is an intransitive verb. This is not uh, the most frequent type that we find. As I said, uh, the regular type is to have a transitive verb and a genitive subject, but that also occurs already in classical Armenian. Just for comparison, uh, let's have a short look finally at modern Eastern Armenian. Um, the resultative function of the participle in eal that we've just seen is taken over by a different form, namely the participle in atz. Uh, so there are forms like bajnel, separate, bajnats, separated, gerel, write, gerats, written. It goes back to a form in atz, in classical Armenian already, which served mainly as a verbal noun. So for example, there is kotorel to slaughter and kotorats, slaughter, or it formed denominal adjectives like yerkyur, fear, and yerkyurats, fearful. So here are two examples uh, with this form. Uh, the participle with resultative function, girkyurgeratse, the book is written, or yes, nastatsem, I am sitting. So two forms with arts. Um, derived from the respective verbs gerem and nestim that we've already come across. Um, together with the participle in uh, L, which developed out of the classical form in eal by regular sound change, um, modern Armenian, modern Eastern Armenian forms the perfect tense together with the copula, and this denotes an action in the past with current relevance. So, for example, yes, eid girke katatselem, I have read this book. No? Um, the classical perfect in eal, uh, which in most cases has a resultative meaning, has thus developed into a perfect tense. Its original function is being taken over by the participle in atz. Uh, these two examples taken from Nedjalkov uh, show that the temporal adverb dare still is incompatible with the terminative verb to fall in the perfect as the latter does not express duration up to the present, but it is compatible with the resultative in arts expressing a continuing state. So it is okay uh, to say na, der, and katze, so he, this one, na, der, and katze, uh, he is still fallen, still lying on the ground, but it's not okay to say na, der, and kele, uh, with this form, he has still fallen. So we see uh, a difference here between the classical and the modern language. Okay, in this session we have seen nonverbal predication, the copula verbs that Armenian has, the various forms of negation, the use of pronouns and the basic functions of its verbal categories, including the aspectual opposition in the past and the use of the perfect. Thank you for your attention.